All righty. We are, my clock is just showing 11 Pacific and whatever that means to all of you, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, looks like a few people are filtering, filtering in, but I will get us started. So um, hello everyone. Welcome to the Rainbow Ecoscience Plant Healthcare webinar series. Before we get started, I'm going to do a quick safety brief for everyone. So please, if you are at your home offices or in your offices, check your surroundings for any trip. Uh, depending on where you are, please check the weather forecast for any inclement weather. If there's um, an emergency, obviously step away from your computers and go find a safe spot. If you are in your vehicle, please be parked uh, in a safe location. Um, this is of the utmost importance. And if you are in your vehicle, um, you can do this and just listen, and you are actively driving, please just be in listen mode only. No screens, nothing like that. You can just listen to this webinar. So um, that's that's that. If there's anything else you can think of, uh, please let us know. I am Allison Harrell. I am the arborologist uh, based out in the Pacific Northwest for Rainbow Ecoscience. I will be your moderator today. Um, just so you know that I'm all here. And the most important things, housekeeping. So uh, you'll notice on the bottom, you've got chats and Q&A. So if you did not type in your ISA CEUs uh, or your ISA number when you registered, please type that into the Q&A box right now in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, if you already registered your number, you don't need to type it again. The webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent out and the webinar is worth one ISA CEU. And without further ado, I will just get things popping. So, oh, also type your questions that you actually have in the Q&A as well. I'll clear out the queue um, for your ISA numbers and make sure that we're, we're doing the questions at the end to, to moderate. So it is my pleasure to introduce today our speakers. We have Dr. Tom Smiley. He is the senior arboriculture researcher with the Bartlett Tree Research Lab. Um, he comes to us with decades of experience in arboriculture and um, a whole host of education, um, bachelor's in, and master's in plant pathology and a PhD in urban forestry, and has really gotten to experience all of the tree things from across the country. So we're extremely pleased to have him here, along with Sean Burnick, who is the general manager at Rainbow Ecoscience. Uh, he has a bachelor's in horticulture and agriculture education and a master's in plant pathology as well. And they are the co-authors on the ISA Best Management Practice in Tree Injection, which is what they're gonna be talking about today. So, here we have it. I'm going to turn it over to you all. Tree injection, BMP, best practices, uh, what's new and important for arborists. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. All right. I am going to switch over to the presenter mode. All right, Allison, is that coming up uh, where it should be? Yep, you're good to go. Thank you, Allison, for that kind introduction and welcome everybody. It's really excited to have um, uh, a number of people from throughout the U.S. joining today to listen in to Dr. Smiley and I present here. And it's really a, uh, an honor for me to present with Tom here, who I got to do a lot of work on this BMP together. So hopefully you're in a part of the country you've already started injecting trees or doing plant health care treatments in somewhere warmer than Minneapolis, St. Paul from where I'm out of. So uh, today's presentation, so we're going to talk about um, a couple of things. You'll leave with the following outcomes, hopefully gaining an understanding about ISA's best management practices. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the new additions in the second edition, which recently came out. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the role of tree injection in an integrated approach for managing tree health care problems. A couple of things uh, on the BMP itself. So you can purchase the best management practices second edition directly off of the ISA website just by going into their store there. About $20 for members and then $26 or so for non-members. As I mentioned, this is the second edition. The original publication uh, was published back in 2015. 
And uh, it was my first experience working on BMPs for ISA. And there's quite a bit of work that went into this, about almost three years from idea to publication. And this was a, a, a BMP that I think was really needed in the industry. Um, if you look at transaction as an application, while it's been around for almost probably 100 years, um, over the last couple of decades, there's been a significant amount of interest in transaction. And I think that really stems from the increase in the use of this uh, application technique for managing invasive insect pests and other key problems that we find on trees. Um, so it's really, I think, a great uh, value to the industry and something that uh, provides a, a good contribution to arborist practitioners. As I mentioned, I got the pleasure to co-author this uh, with Dr. Smiley, and we also worked with um, over uh, 39 different reviewers, uh, reviewers that come from the industry, from academia. We had reviewers from manufacturer companies, pre-injection device companies, as well as municipal arborists. And between the first and the second edition, we almost doubled the number of reviewers that we had uh, work on the second edition. We also had a number of reviewers that were international from other parts of the world that uh, added on uh, some comments. So a lot of experts in both the practical field coming from industry, as well as um, from uh, university settings. And I think that's one of the neat things about these BMPs. They blend in university research and what's known currently in the body of research that's out there with consensus on practices that industry practitioners do. Starting off with a definition here as we dig in. So tree injection is the process of applying a treatment into the active xylem of a tree where it's distributed throughout the tree. So you have this process of tree injection, and then we're also working with systemic applications of different products, uh, insecticides, fungicides, there's some growth regulators, uh, and some different nutrients that can be applied via tree injection. All of these products are what we call systemically uh, transported through typically the xylem vessels uh, into the above ground portions of the tree. A little bit of background on BMPs. So the International Society of Arbar Culture, which was established almost 100 years ago now, serves the tree care industry as our scientific and educational organization to support us as arborists. And through their research technology education, the ISA promotes professional practice of arboriculture and fosters a greater worldwide awareness of the benefits of trees. And I think these BMPs that they have published over the years are in direct service to their mission. Um, the ISA governs and produces and publishes the BMPs for our industry. And each BMP, as we talked about for this one on tree injection, is authored and peer reviewed by industry and academia on a specific topic. There's numerous BMPs that you can go and see at the ISA website, and there's a number of them that are now in Spanish and more and more keep getting produced each and every year. So BMPs really are designed to interpret tree care standards and provide guidelines uh, of practice for arborists, practitioners, tree workers, and people who take on tree services. If you look at the, the purpose and kind of why we have BMPs as an industry, really the key thing that I see is it, it helps to create alignment on different practices to standardize different industry practices. So if you have contractors, they're performing those services to the same standard. It's also a way to describe acceptable, acceptable practices that can be implemented by uh, people in the industry. And then it provides a frame of reference to compare practices against. Another note, which I didn't put on here, but I think one of the neat things about BMPs too is it takes what's currently known in the research, blends it in with what's being practically done out in the field. And it also I, it probably illuminates some certain things that we can also do more research on and guide future research on in the future. So if you look at the tree injection BMP, when we first contemplated writing this, I, I think the use case came from there being a lot of different tree injection devices out in the industry a number of different formulations, different recommendations. And so there was really a, a missing in the industry of having 
uh, recommendations and acceptable practices. Um, lots of questions that came up frequently about how do we drill? Um, should injections occur on the trunk or the root flare? Should we use plugs or not use plugs? Uh, which methods, devices should we use? Um, should we fill holes with caulk or dowels after they're done? So a lot of these questions that came up throughout uh, conversations with practitioners that I think you'll, you'll find answered in this BMP. So really, we wanted to create consistent practices and guidelines. Uh, we also wanted to create a BMP that would help practitioners minimize tree wounding. All tree injection devices, you're making some type of wound in the tree. The BMP helps to minimize the wounds and helps the tree to, to compartmentalize those wounds. And so one of the key pieces that we wanted to provide some direction in the BMP was is to create uh, recommendations to minimize tree wounding. The BMP itself is, is, I think, a really key part or can be a key part of what tree care companies and, and uh, maybe municipal organizations, anybody that's doing tree injections can use this to train in your technicians. I always find it handy to have this BMP on hand to reference as part of uh, training for tree injection practitioners. Um, have multiple copies that technicians can have on hand, put it in maybe the the glove box of the truck so they can read it maybe when they're on their lunch break. Uh, but it has a lot of great standardized practices that uh, new people coming into the industry or practitioners can be trained on. The other nice part about the BMP is it has helped to create consistent bid specification language. So if you have government or city municipal bids that are out, uh, municipal foresters can look at the specifications that are included in the one of the appendixes of the BMP to standardize those bid specs. So contractors are providing similar price quotes in their uh, responses to those bid RFPs that cities put out there. And that's been a, a real, I think that's a, a common thing that we see now with things like emerald ash borer and cities treating for uh, EAB and other invasive pests. We want to make sure that there's some standardization in those bid specs. If we look at the second edition BMP, uh, here's the table of contents, and we're going to follow the table of contents as we go through the presentation here. We've got a purpose, introduction, it'll go through why use tree injection, types of tree injection, some of the damage from tree injection, and then we'll get into application considerations. Um, actually doing the injections, uh, record keeping, and then the two appendices at the end of this, one is on the tree ring porosity. And then also, as I mentioned, there are sample bid specifications that can be used as well. Now, what's new in the second edition uh, versus the first edition? There's some updated illustrations that help to uh, point out the key uh, points in the BMP. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned, we've doubled the number of reviewers and many new re reviewers bringing in their expertise and insights. Uh, there's a nice IPM flowchart that I'll show in a few slides here that helps as a decision tree for selecting when and if you should use tree injection against other treatment methods and techniques. And then there's also some updated um, information in the application considerations uh, as well that we'll talk about here. So chapter one uh, makes the case or, or goes uh, through why you should use tree injection. And the first key point I think chapter one makes is that when you look at tree injection, it's a part of an overall plant health care toolbox. And if we look at this methodology or this approach to managing plant health, plant health care is really a comprehensive program for managing the appearance the structure of the vitality of trees in the landscape, all of which must occur within expectations that we have to set with clients. So things that are included in this are proper pruning, nutrient and fertilization, management of tree growth, uh, management of insects and diseases. All of these are critical components uh, that arborists have to perform to manage the health of trees. Integrated pest management is a component of managing plant health that requires arborists to properly diagnose pests, carefully consider the different issues that might be going on, as well as how do we solve or manage that issue that the tree is dealing with. 
determines if we should use chemical treatments or shouldn't use chemical treatments. So I wanna make this point that tree injection is really only one application method in the arborist practitioner's toolbox. You have to weigh the pros and cons of using it and review it against other application methods and techniques and determine if it's the best approach um, to the particular situation that you're, you're dealing with. Here's the flow chart that I referenced before. This is new in the second edition. This actually goes through the uh, IPM terminology for making decisions around selecting specific, specific chemical treatments. So at this point, you've determined you wanna consider a chemical approach to managing the particular issue you're dealing with. It breaks it down into the three key application methods that we use. Uh, as, as arborists, we have spray applications and those can typically be foliar. Uh, we can have trunk and limb sprays. Those are on contact sprays. We can also have what's called systemic basal bark sprays where you're spraying the lower few feet of the tree and it's systemically taken up, uh, moves through the lenticels and, and taken up by the xylem. Uh, those are kind of in our spray application methods and techniques. And then we have soil applications, which we can make to the surface or subsurface of the soil. Those are uh, systemic applications typically. And then we have what we're talking about today, which are injection treatments. And we're gonna talk about the two different application techniques, which are macro and micro tree injection. The BMP itself doesn't get into specific treatments, but note at the bottom of this decision tree, you have to make a, a decision on which specific product you're going to, to use based on your situation, the scenario you're dealing with. So for tree injection, there's certain pests that have really only one application option. And for tree injection, excuse me, things like the vascular wilts, like Dutch elm disease, oak wilt, uh, bacterial leaf scorch, these are diseases that you can only manage effectively by using tree injection treatments. There's other problems out there like emerald ash borer where you can use different methods and techniques that we talked about earlier, sprays, soil applications, or tree injection treatments. Tree injection uh, really is a, a great option for these vascular wilts. The two types of tree injection, there's the macro injection method and the micro injection method. And we're gonna break these down so you have these and Tom will talk about these further. Thank you, Sean. Yes, uh, so I'm gonna go on with a little more detail here and then Sean's gonna come back and wrap things up. So as Sean was saying, we have uh, two major types of tree injection. Macro injection was uh, the first uh, methodology developed. It was widely used starting in the 70s uh, to treat uh, Dutch elm disease. And there were many different applicators uh, at that time, many different pieces of equipment, and they've sort of gone through an evolutionary process where the good ones are still around and the other ones uh, have disappeared over time. But we've gotten a lot more sophisticated uh, with application um, machinery now tools. Um, let's see here, my advance is not working. Um, okay, let me give it another try. John, okay, there we go. So uh, a lot of work has gone into developing um, micro injection technology, and we'll go into the definitions and a few examples of these as we go along. But this is, you know, relatively new in the evolution of tree injection. Uh, and then we have a sort of a subset of the micro injection, the implants and infusion products. And again, some of these products uh, do uh, date back uh, at least into the 70s uh, where they have been used uh, quite successfully for some nutrient and pest issues. Um, so uh, starting with macro injection, what we're talking about here is putting a large volume of solution into the tree. Uh, so that needs to be diluted. 
um, and we're, we're talking uh, gallons per inch. This is a, a sort of a typical Dutch elm disease sort of treatment. Uh, and the reason that we have to go to this uh, system is the products uh, tend to be a little bit more damaging. So if they're not highly diluted, uh, we can end up with some phytotoxicity. And we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, so this is a, a common uh, treatment for Dutch elm disease. It's not the only treatment, but a common one for Dutch elm disease. Uh, and also we see it a lot on oak wilt uh, treatments. And again, we do have some options there. Uh, with micro injection, what we're looking at here are smaller volumes in the range of milliliters or ounces per inch of DBH, so we don't have to put in as much water. Uh, the products here tend to be much safer for the tree, so we can use them at higher concentrations. Uh, we can put in uh, dilute products here, or there are some products that actually go in without dilution, a very efficient application uh, technology for uh, concentrate. Uh, very common for many of our insecticide applications. There are also some nutrient applications uh, that can go in at very high concentration. Some injection systems use plugs and some other systems uh, are consisting of, of something that looks like a plug. I have a picture of that coming up uh, in just a minute. Uh, and these uh, are intended uh, to increase the efficiency of the application uh, methodology. It's not required by every device out there, but there are some devices that use these plugs um, and they can have some benefits. Uh, sometimes leakage with a product can be excessive. Um, in that you're putting it in under pressure, and if you pull your injector out too quickly, uh, you may get some of that product squirting out at you. Uh, the, uh, the plugs uh, will keep that in, in the tree. So again, not every product or application device needs these, uh, but one place that we do see issues uh, with plugs is not setting them correctly. And this has to do with plugs and uh, some of the implant devices. So um, this is a diagram out of the BMP, uh, just showing uh, some of the concerns that we want to set the top of that plug uh, or the um, uh, cap device that goes into the tree uh, right below the cambium. So into the wood, but not too deeply into the wood. If it's too deeply set as the figure uh, B shows here, uh, we could be missing a lot of our active xylem. So the material will not be taken up uh, or distributed well within the tree. And then another problem we see is not setting the plug deeply enough. Uh, we'll show you some uh, damage photos that are typically associated with not setting it deep enough. Uh, and again, if we're not setting it deep enough, uh, when this is pressurized, we tend to have uh, more pressure sort of damage uh, to the cambium and the phloem that we would have avoided if we had set the top of that plug just below the cambial layer. So a uh, good idea to uh, drill the hole, look into it and see where these different layers are uh, so that you get it in at the right depth. Okay. Um, plugs are also commonly used on palms. Uh, palms are unique in that uh, we can reuse the plugs for a, a little while. Uh, they're not a once and done sort of thing, but uh, because of the different vascular system of palms, uh, they can be reused a few times if they're left in the tree. Uh, often they do need to be reset uh, in case the vascular system has uh, closed those wounds. Uh, and again, uh, setting these uh, precisely is key to getting them to work well. 
Then we move on to implants and infusions. Uh, some of the implants go way back again into the 70s or before. Uh, a newer example on the lower left here, it's basically just a gel cap uh, with powder inside. Uh, as the sap flow goes through the xylem, uh, the gel cap is dissolved and the product can move into the tree. Uh, so again, uh, very safe for the applicator, no dilution needed on that one. Um, moving to the center and right uh, hand side photos, we have uh, uh, macro, I'm sorry, we have uh, micro infusion devices where we have a relatively low quantity of a liquid in both of these cases um, that is put in under uh, a little bit of pressure. Uh, and again, the product is pre diluted or mixed uh, prior to application. And again, one of the differentiating factors here is the lack of pressure. Uh, so these can take uh, a little bit longer for uptake and the dry powder materials again have to be dissolved by that sap. So obviously we're going to have issues uh, with timing. We have to have good sap flow uh, for that material to be distributed uh, with all the implant and infusion devices. So uh, if we want to compare these devices, again, there's no one perfect product. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, with the macro injector, it's a high dilution uh, device, and that can be very good with uh, products that would be phytotoxic at higher concentration. Uh, the micro injectors uh, tend to have low or no dilution, again, depending on the product. Um, and then the implants and infusion, uh, low or no um, dilution there as well. Um, okay. um, there are multi-port devices with the macro injection. So typically with the macro, we're going to be uh, installing a, uh, a port at uh, each root flare. We'll talk more about that as we go along. The micros come in a couple of different flavors. They can be a single port where you do one site at a time or multi-port, and that multi-port may be a three or five port, uh, depending on the device uh, that you're using. And then the uh, implants and infusion devices typically are uh, one hole per device. Um, so with the macro, it takes a while to set up. It's not unusual to take 20 or maybe 30 minutes to set up a system like that. You have to have lots of water on board uh, to dilute your product, so it takes some time there. Um, with the uh, micro devices, uh, sort of medium uh, installation, time, uh, you know, you still have to drill the holes, put in the devices, uh, uptake tends to be pretty quick uh, with the micro injectors. And then with the implants and infusers, pretty quick to install. Uh, there may be a wait time if you're waiting around to remove those devices from the tree. And again, uh, some of them do not need to be uh, removed from the tree, but uh, most of those do. Uh, the macro can take some time, you know, if we're looking at 30 or 50 gallons going into a tree, that can take a long time uh, and uh, a little, little less dependable on what that time is, which makes it very difficult in some cases to bid the work. With uh, micro injectors tend to be faster, more dependable on the uptake time. And again, in the micro uh, in implants and infusers, uh, it can be uh, variable depending uh, on a lot of factors. And we'll talk about some of those factors again as we go along today. So uh, the next chapter in the BMP we'll cover here is potential damage. So we can damage uh, trees in a number of different ways. Uh, one is chemical damage. So the product that we put into the tree may cause phytotoxicity to the leaves. Uh, and again, if you follow manufacturer's recommendations, all of these products uh, have been 
pretty well tested. Uh, we shouldn't be seeing this sort of damage, but occasionally it does happen. Sometimes water sprouts on the trunk uh, will show up some damage, uh, usually not very long lasting with any of this damage. Uh, but sometimes we'll lose all the leaves from a tree, but they, they tend to come back uh, on um, with the next flood, uh, generally without long lasting damage. But again, uh, read the label of the product that you're putting in and uh, follow that label very carefully. Then uh, occasionally we'll see uh, physical damage to the tree. And again, we typically now recommend root flare injections. You can see uh, these injection uh, sites were all a little bit higher than that, which uh, can be a bit of an issue. You're better off injecting into those root flares. Um, and then a lot of this damage uh, is from improperly setting uh, plug devices. Uh, sometimes it is over pressurizing uh, during installation uh, and rarely is this a product issue unless the dilution rate is not correct. Um, you know, damage within the tree, Rich Tower up at the University of Wisconsin has been looking into this uh, with ash trees that have received multiple injections over uh, the course of EAB treatments. And what they're finding is not really very much damage within the tree. So that's sort of good news uh, for all of us that do this sort of work. Uh, the, the damage in general uh, is not not very uh, widespread. We can see some like on the photo uh, on the left, but it tends to be located very close to those injection sites. And we'll give you some uh, recommendations how to uh, reduce this sort of damage uh, as we go along. So moving on then to application considerations. Uh, one of the things we like to do is uh, use a device that requires the smallest hole practical. Now, hole size is going to vary with that device that you're using. Uh, some devices use uh, larger holes than others, but if you're if you have a choice, uh, we like to go with the smallest uh, hole possible. And then uh, our treatment cycle. So we never want to treat with injection more than once a year. And the less frequent our applications, the better. We'll do some comparisons on this uh, as we go along uh, to look at those numbers of holes. If we can, uh, we like to keep the new holes separated from the old holes so that if there is any damage uh, in the xylem, that that damage does not coalesce. So uh, again, the further we can keep those apart, uh, radially around the trunk uh, especially, the better. Um, we no longer fill holes with either dowels or caulk or any other materials. They tend to close uh, pretty quickly if they're just uh, allowed to do that. So uh, dowels and caulk and things like that uh, don't really seem to keep uh, anything out of these holes uh, and they can slow this wound closure. Okay, so uh, injection uh, timing, there are a number of factors to look at, and we'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail after we give you the list. Uh, but start uh, with pest biology. So when is that pest active? Uh, when is it most susceptible to treatment? We'll give you a few examples as we go along. Uh, the tree phenology. So what stage is that tree in? Is it dormant? Uh, is it close to leaf drop or is it growing rapidly? Uh, that will make a big difference on water movement within the tree. Uh, then we have chemical formulations. So some formulations will move very quickly into the tree in a matter of hours or days at the longest. Others uh, sort of take their time. They may be adhered to the xylem and it may uh, unadhere and then move up a little and readhere. So it may take some time to get into the tree. So if you know your formulations, you can find information on how quickly it moves and that'll give you some guidance 
uh, on exactly when you should be injecting. And residual activity. Some materials will last multiple years, where others are pretty well gone within months or certainly within the growing season. Uh, environmental factors. So, uh, you know, we, we would like to inject on ideal days. We can't always wait for ideal days, but we'll talk about uh, good times uh, to inject trees based on time of day uh, and weather concerns. So going a little bit more, more deeply into these, starting with pest biology, uh, probably one of the most commonly uh, injected for insects now is uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, we know very well this life cycle now, uh, and it will depend, of course, how far north or south you are uh, when these different stages uh, occur. Uh, but generally, we like to hit these insects uh, when there's peak activity uh, in the xylem, uh, especially when the eggs are hatching or larvae are starting to feed, uh, that's when they're most susceptible to most of our products. And an example here is uh, June through the middle of August tends to be uh, when they are active. So if we can put in a product uh, a little bit before or during that window, depending on the residual activity of that product, uh, it would be in general a good time to treat for that insect. Um, so phenology uptake is best when trees are obviously healthy, which you know we're, we're not actually treating all that many healthy trees, uh, but we do want them fully leafed out uh, and as vigorous as possible. Uh, we want to avoid treating when trees are stressed or have serious dieback. We'll talk about weather conditions as we go along. So uh, when leaves are just coming out, as the picture on the upper right there, uh, some products can cause damage at this stage. So again, check those labels. Uh, make sure that if you want to get it in early, uh, that the product won't be damaging at that life stage. And then uh, residual activity, uh, a nice uh, diagram uh, with an example of elm trees. We've got a couple of different products and injection techniques that you can use for elm trees. Uh, one of them is the macro injection that is done basically every three years. Um, and the other is a, a micro injection that is done every year. So the macro injection is going to take longer to set up. Uh, it's going to take longer to uh, get into the tree. Um, but over a period of time, you're going to have fewer holes. In this case, 135 holes versus 405 uh, based on the annual application. So you don't always have these choices, uh, but this is a nice example showing when you have the choices uh, that you can consider um, either of these two products. They all have uh, benefits and um, uh, downsides to the product. So the ideal condition, and again, we can't always inject under these conditions, but this is what we target. Uh, so after leaf out is complete in the spring, we have very good translocation there. Adequate soil moisture, if we don't have it naturally, this is something we can ask the client to do to irrigate both before and after application. Uh, low humidity, if we have low humidity, that's really going to drive the process. But if we're in drought, uh, that's a little bit too far. The stomates tend to close when we're in drought, so less transpiration. But in general, if we have adequate soil moisture, the low humidity is beneficial for water movement uh, through the plant. Clear or slightly cloudy skies, again, are ideal. Light wind, again, this all has to do with the transpiration. Uh, these are ideal conditions for transpiration. Moderate temperatures, we neither want it uh, too hot nor too cold. We can run into phytotoxicity uh, problems if it's too hot uh, and too cool may just slow the, app, uh, the uptake time. 
Time of the day, uh, morning is often better than afternoon in the summer. Uh, we usually have more uh, translocation in the morning. So uh, if a plant health care specialist is running a mixed route, I would always direct them uh, to doing the injections first thing in the morning. And then if you're doing, say, fertilizer or spray applications, save them for the afternoon. Uh, again, uh, the uh, injection time uh, much shorter uh, in the morning on a typical basis. And then uh, again, toward the end of the day, when things have started to cool down, we ha may have uh, more translocation going on, especially if there's adequate soil moisture uh, that we can come back to it at the end of the day uh, if need be. Um, and then uh, obviously you have to work within the parameters of the site. You can't always work at every site uh, at all times of the day or night. We also wanted to just uh, mention that different trees have different wood structures uh, and the porosity of the wood, whether it's ring forest, diffuse porous or non-porous, meaning the conifers, uh, is going to impact the speed of movement in the xylem. So in general, the ring porous trees have a much faster uptake time uh, so we can move that product more quickly. It falls off with the diffuse porous and we need more pressure or more time, uh, especially with the conifers uh, that don't have wood vessels. We also can look at time of year. So this is a very nice uh, figure uh, from Ford and others. And what we're looking at is the whole tree water usage. That's the scale on the left up to 100%. Um, and then uh, it's plotted versus uh, month of the year. It, with the black dots, we are looking at North Carolina. So probably a zone eight there, and then Massachusetts, I'm not sure what that is, maybe six or so, depending where they are. So big differences uh, in climate zone and how early things warm up. With the North Carolina site, uh, we're starting to get more water movement, uh, especially uh, in March and April. So sort of an ideal time to be uh, trunk injecting uh, in, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, but at that time of year uh, in Massachusetts, we're still not having uh, the uptake time uh, that we would want for rapid uptake. So uh, this is the North Carolina ideal earlier uh, around now. Uh, and then uh, with um, Massachusetts, uh, we're gonna be waiting till April, May, uh, maybe even as late as June or July uh, for most effective uptake. And this is uh, in uh, relationship to hemlock, woolly, adelgid especially. Uh, but does apply to other insects as well. So soil moisture is certainly a big one uh, with transportation or translocation within the tree and uh, water uptake. Uh, so uh, if it is dry, if we're under drought conditions and you must inject, uh, having the client irrigate a day or two before application is ideal. Uh, I know some arborist representatives carry a soaker hose and timers in their trunk, and they would uh, go out to the client's house a few days before, set the, uh, the timer to run a few hours every night uh, to get that soil nice and moist prior to application, and it saves a lot of time on the job, and it does a much better job for the client in that will get better distribution uh, within the tree. In general, with injections, we want to avoid applications with high temperatures, meaning greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, whenever possible. And again, this mainly goes to phytotoxicity and uptake time. Uh, when we're in those high temperatures, uh, the stomates are gonna be closing during the day. We're gonna have less translocation, so it's gonna take longer uh, for uptake. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sean. Uh, so go ahead, Sean. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, so chapter five is on the administering of the injections. 
So we'll dig into that here. So there's a couple of uh, key things when we are actually doing the injections. Number one, we're gonna talk about injection location. We'll talk about site spacing, uh, drilling the injection holes, proper mixing and dosing, and then we'll get into injecting the tree itself. So the first key distinction we wanna talk about as far as injection site placements is, I think probably one of the key uh, principles within the BMP is that whenever possible, the preferred location to make injection sites is going to be on the root flare. The root flare is the transition zone from trunk to roots where the trunk expands into the buttress or the structural root. So you can see on this really large elm tree here, our root flares are gonna start right here above grade. And then these nice root flares extend down uh, to grade and actually go below the soil line as well. So these root flares are excellent sites for injection locations. And if we look at, um, this is actually a picture that uh, Dr. Smiley took um, a number of years back at the Tree Biomechanics Workshop. And so what you're looking at here is a longitudinal cross section of a root flare. And so this is, uh, it shows a, a great photo of why the root flare is such a critical uh, location for injection site placement. You can see the amount of sapwood tissue on the root flare relative to up higher on the trunk is much greater down on the root flare. So that gives us um, a lot more sapwood to inject in. That's gonna help with the distribution of the chemistries. It's also gonna have a uh, result in faster uptake of the, of the products that we're injecting. And then it's going to allow for faster compartmentalization of the wounds and wound closure when we make the applications uh, into the root flares versus the trunk. And then we also uh, will we'll, uh, have greater distribution of the chemistries that we're applying throughout the tree when we target those root flare areas. That root flare is growing at a much greater rate than the above ground or the, the trunk higher up on the trunk. And so it makes it a it's just a lot more um, volume of sapwood, active sapwood that we can inject into. In some cases, if the root flare isn't exposed or you don't have root flare above ground, some practitioners will also excavate a few inches below ground as well. Um, and oftentimes they'll dig a shallow uh, a moat right at the base of the tree and then they'll brush off those root flares so that they're injecting into consistent uh, tissue. Below grade, you don't have the variable thickness of the bark tissue to have to worry about with your injection depth and the way that you seat the tees. So some practitioners will actually excavate below grade uh, so you can get on that root flare tissue where you're not dealing with the variable bark tissue. As far as site placements themselves, you wanna make sure that you evenly space the injection sites around the base of the tree, again, targeting root flares. Um, you wanna avoid the valleys in between the root flares, and you also wanna avoid any damage, decayed or dead areas. Um, as that will certainly up, uh, impact um, uptake. It can also uh, slow down wound closure as well. So again, these are systemic products. It's important that we apply them evenly to the tree and target those uh, root flares around the base of the tree in an even manner so that our chemistries get up into the tree and thoroughly um, uh, protect the, the portion of the tree that we're looking to protect above ground. Drilling. Drilling is a very detail-oriented aspect of the actual injection process. And so there's a, a number of key factors, key points when we talk about drilling that the BMT talks about. Number one, we don't want to spin the drill bit in the hole excessively. We don't want to cauterize or burn that um, tissue inside the injection hole. We want to make one quick, clean, continuous motion in and out of the tree. Uh, making a surgeon-like cut. And then typically we'll drill perpendicular to the tree or uh, depending on the in device manufacturer's recommendation, they might tell you uh, differently. The drill bits themselves, we wanna use razor sharp drill bits. We wanna basically uh, allow that tissue to be cut open, exposing as much of the active xylem tissue as possible. We don't wanna rip it, burn it, fray it, um, 
So we want to use sharp drill bits. Uh, high helix drill bits are a recommendation that we make at Rainbow. These drill bits have much more cutting surface. Uh, and typically, um, a recommendation that is made in the BMP is to replace your drill bits every five to medium, uh, five to 10 medium to large trees. And yes, this is an additional cost, but having sharp drill bits can increase your uptake speed so your applicators aren't having to stand at the base of the tree watching products go in as much. And it also helps with ensuring a better wound closure and better distribution in the canopy when we're using sharp drill bits. So definitely a good recommendation to have uh, sharp drill bits. Injection depth. So the solutions were targeting that active xylem tissue. And so when uh, Dr. Smiley talked about the speed of uptake and it being influenced by the different types of tree species, um, the ring porosity or the porosity of the, the um, sapwood is important as it relates to injection depth as well. With ring porous trees, most of the xylem that's active, that's translocating water nutrients, as well as these systemic products is gonna be in that outer growth ring. Whereas ring porous species, you have the outer few growth rings that are gonna be active for taking up products. So with a ring porous species, this act, active growth ring, this outer growth ring is what we're targeting. So we don't wanna drill deeper into the tree where our injection port or T is gonna be pushed in too deep. We wanna get the product moving up into that outer growth ring. Whereas in a ring porous tree, you have more years growth that are gonna be active. So you can drill a little bit deeper into those trees. Um, this shows uh, figure 10 here is a, just an illustration showing the anatomy. We have our outer bark, our phloem, our cambium, which is a very thin layer, and then our sapwood, our xylem tissue, uh, which we're targeting when we're treating with trees. And that depends on the species, if it's gonna be that outer growth ring or uh, if we can drill a little bit deeper into the tree. The heartwood, that basically is non-conducting tissue, and we really don't need to ever drill that deep into a into the heartwood tissue, I'm just doing unnecessary wounding at that point. <clears throat> Mixing and dosing, really this comes down to following the label instructions. Um, we want to ensure that if there's water that's needed to dilute the treatments, uh, that we're following those instructions. As uh, we talked about earlier with macro treatments, most of our macro injection treatments are typically diluted with water, whereas our micro injection treatments may or may not be diluted with water. Uh, a couple of things when it, when it comes to mixing and dosing, some products require uh, specific pH in your water quality. So certain products may fall out of suspension if it's too high of a pH. Um, and this is also a good uh, spot when you're working with tree injection devices, if you can calibrate your dose to make sure that you calibrate uh, the, the injection dose being applied at each injection site and for the entire tree for those devices where you can do that. Chapter six is around record keeping and legal considerations. So the BMP does provide some direction on this. Ultimately, whatever is required by your state or government agencies that oversees the application of pre-injection pesticides, you wanna make sure that you're following at a minimum their legal uh, record keeping uh, requirements. Um, we recommend at a minimum having the address, the date, time, the species that you've treated, where that tree was located on the property, the product you use, the tree injection device you use, the dose applied, and then capturing the environmental conditions um, at a minimum. And then also the tree size, uh, number of injection sites, and the condition of the tree are things you should consider uh, capturing. So those are the various chapters in the BMP. As we talked about earlier, there is two key appendices. We have the appendix that talks about ring porous versus diffuse porous. Again, this has ramifications on the speed of uptake and translocation throughout these species, as well as the injection hole depth. Um, and then we have a nice chart that lists out which species uh, fall into which of those categories. And then the appendix B, uh, rounds out the BMP. This is really a sample bid specifications and the tree injection contract language. So this is a really great document that uh, ISA has, has created. 
Uh, it's something that I would recommend if you're doing tree injection treatments that you have copies on and use this as part of your training um, and use this as part of, of your tree injection services or if you're a city, uh, consider using the sample bid specifications that can be standardized uh, for when contractors reply to bid specs. So with that, that is the presentation. Allison, if you have questions for Tom and I, it looks like we got a few minutes where we can address some of those. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna steal this screen back from you. So before, well, I'll do the Q&A, but I'll pop this up in case anybody does need to pop off. So we are giving one ISA CEU. This is the code for your records. You do not need to do anything with this. Just know that this is the course code if you would like to see that. We also have a few more webinars coming up in our spring webinar series. So we'd love for you to join us. Um, and then with that, I will uh, take some questions. Uh -oh. Uh, Allison, I don't know if that code showed. I did not see Okay, it. cool. Hang on one second. <laughs> so just in case we want to read it out loud, do, 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 do. it is MW23096. Okay, cool. There we go. So, all right, this is a great question. Where should you inject a tree that has been grafted onto rootstock? Into the rootstock or into the trunk above the rootstock? You want to take a time or you want me to? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's a tough one. I, all these questions are pretty tough ones. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we've had this question uh, a number of times come in on ash trees, and I've actually seen it done both ways. And in both situations, um, we, it resulted in the tree being protected from emerald ash borer. Um, I, you know, I, I would think you might, that, that's just my personal experience. I don't know if there's been any research done on that or not. At the beginning of my career, I often thought you had to eject above that graft just because if there was any um, connections in there that weren't, um, you know, weren't, weren't intricately connected between the graft top to bottom. But I, I don't know. It's probably a graduate student project. Maybe it is. I, I would think if you know if we have water moving up from the roots into the stem, we should be fine doing the uh, the root flare uh, injection there, uh, unless there's an incompatibility again. problem. And again, we do see some incompatibility issues with grafts. Uh, you know, I've seen eight inch trees fall over because of root uh, of, of graft incompatibility. So as long as it's compatible, it shouldn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, Anna wants to know if we can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, Anna, if you can just message one of us directly, uh, I think that's probably going to be the best way. So, but we're happy to share that. So if anybody would like that, the recording will be coming out though, if you need to reference that. Okay. All right. I have seen elms with multiple stems where injection sites close to the root flare are impossible due to the close spacing of stems. Is the solution to locate the sites wherever you can drill or place tees, even if it's several feet above the trunk? It's a good question. I think it means multi stems when you're trying to get around in between them. Yeah, yeah. So that's one, that's one, I guess, exception where we would recommend going up higher on the trunk so that you protect the internal part or wherever those um, stems are connected. If you skip that area, there's a, a pretty high potential that you wouldn't protect those trees from the insect or the disease that you're, you're treating for as you go up the canopy. Right, so I, I would uh, put in the root flare injectors and uh, up above as well. Uh, the root flare injection uh, should go a long way, but yes, there may be misses. Um, so, yep. Well, yeah, especially too. when you think about for Dutch elm disease, if you're trying to get even complete distribution, you'll wanna go yes. around the complete root flare the best that you can, but then you'll probably, you'll need to go up to get around into the center section. Yep. Okay, so Christopher, this answer, uh, this question was answered during the talk, but I don't know if you want to elaborate, Tom. Um, conifers being injected in 
spring or fall, and your data clearly showed spring. Tom, I didn't know if you want to elaborate on that. Uh, no, I, that's yeah, that's what the data is showing. When we're getting that good uh, water movement into the plant, that's the time to do it uh, for most pests. But again, it depends on the pests. Okay, we've got some really good <laughs> conifer questions coming through. So any recommendations for successful uptake of amimectin benzoate in white pines? Boy, outside of uh, continuing to follow all the practices in the BMP, conifers are tricky. So the one, the one nuance with conifers is that you want to, as soon as you drill the hole where possible, you want to inject that site or get your product going into the hole as quickly as possible so that you don't allow more resin to fill up the injection site and block those injection holes. Um, that's one key probably difference with conifers. Other than that, um, just again, following the root flare, following some of the, the recommendations in the BMP um, as well to the T. Right. And we also had a question on the root flare with conifers. And again, it's uh, often not as distinct. It may be a little bit harder. Uh, you know, that uh, with some conifers, it's a little bit sharper of a bend between the trunk and the roots. Uh, but in general, we like to go as low as we can. Um, and, you know, I would tend to err uh, by going out onto the root if, uh, if it's not a uh, wide area like we show in many of our photos. Uh, between the trunk and the roots. Well, all right. I am recognizing that we are at time. Tom and Sean, okay. you have a few minutes to stay on for a few more questions. Sure. Okay, sure. cool. Sorry, there's a lot coming in. So this is actually really great. Um, and I'm going to answer this one. Jeff, conifers are injected. Yes, should we inject at the same location on deciduous and conifers? Um, another manufacturer advises higher on deciduous trees. And the answer is the root flare or the flare, the trunk flare, whatever we're calling it. You need to get down low on that base. I mean, if you learn anything from the talk that Tom and Sean just gave, the root flare is the correct spot. Um, okay, this is a good question. How does the size or width of growth rings affect injection uptake? Um, or do, if you have any. Yeah, you know, you don't know necessarily from the outside, uh, you know, you can judge it maybe on growth rate uh, that you would have uh, larger spring wood uh, vessels. Uh, you can't really tell. And again, the ring porous are going to have a, a greater uptake rate in general. So faster to put them in. Cool. All right. This one's good. And then I'm going to cut this off. Um, so if there is a huge, I think this is supposed to be not about eight feet up the tree. How do you inject around to ensure that things reach the canopy? Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, and I guess on that one, I would do the best I, I could yeah. with, I'd still use the root flares, target the root flares again. Um, and I, it's probably one that I would communicate the expectations to the client ahead of time. Um, I, I have seen some, some arborists that will actually climb trees and inject higher up on the trunk, but you know it seems to be a I don't know if that's always practical, but on that I would I would recommend the root flares again here, and yeah. um, you know it could make a case maybe to have your injection sites maybe a little bit closer on the root flare uh, in that area. Cool. And then actually this one last one that we'll take is from Charles. I macro injected my first tree in 1985 with Arbortech, which is still being used for DED. I would never imagine um, how new micro technology has advanced. Is there any R&D on injection systems that we anticipate in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I think there's, well, there's, there's definitely new devices that have come out recently. Um, there seems to be a, you know, a few new devices, a couple maybe every, every decade. So it, it all kind of depends on you know, the manufacturers there, but um, you know. Right, yeah, there's uh, always innovation in equipments and in chemistry. Uh, you know, I saw you see the uh, question on the phosphites uh, and again, they can be uh, bark applied, which in my mind is you know, in general way better. Uh, than trunk injection. So uh, hopefully more products will come along like that one uh, that yep. can be taken up through the soil, through the roots, uh, through the bark. Uh, that would be great. So I think we're going to see a combination of both new uh, devices and better chemistry as we go along. 
Totally agree. And yeah, John, your question on, so it was basically the question on Agrifos. Do you prefer bark, uh, bark spray, trunk drench or injection? And actually we've seen a lot of phytotoxicity just as the photos have showed doing the trunk injection. And again, maybe that technology does advance where we don't see quite as much phyto. Um, but until then, I do think the preferable is the trunk and uh, soil applications. But I do want to make one really quick comment. And Sean alluded to this earlier, which is you need to make sure that your treatments are aligning with the proper diseases and pests that you're dealing with. Because it a, a lot of times, right, like you're just throwing phosphites at stuff for a disease that it doesn't actually treat is kind of malpractice. So please make sure if you all have any questions, this team is available um, to answer that. Um, feel free to email us. And with that, I'm going to close this out. We are done with questions. And thank you both so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Allison. Good work, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.